Hello and welcome to Westbrook. We are so happy that you're joining us online today. Before we start our service, I just wanted to take a quick moment and talk about a few different things that are going to be happening here at Westbrook throughout the summer and in the coming weeks. We have a new sermon series starting up called Intersect that starts next week, June 5th, and it's going to be kind of an overview of the Bible and talk about different parts of the Bible and what has all happened throughout the Bible. And we are really excited to do this to just kind of give people this this landscape of what takes place throughout the Bible. So make sure that you start joining us June 5th for our sermon series, Intersect, as we look over the Bible. We also have Make Waves Summer Bible Study. That's June 5th through July 31st from 5.30 to 7.30. And this is for parents of students currently in 3rd through 5th grade. Register for our, register your students for our summer Bible study and join us as we learn how to build confidence that lasts. That's 3rd through 5th grade, Make Waves Summer Bible Study. Make sure that you register for your student for that. Finally, we want to celebrate your graduates. If you have a graduate that's in that has graduated eighth grade, twelfth grade, or college, we want to honor them. And so I would encourage you to send us their information, you know, what, where they graduated from, maybe college and degree, to info at westbrook.church, and we're going to include them and celebrate them in June twelfth program. So make sure that you send us that information. Before we get into our service, let's take a moment to pray over the offering. If you haven't yet, I encourage you that you can give online. You can give through the link. Um, you can give it uh, through the Church Center app as well. And let's pray for this offering to pray that God would continue to do great things, um, not only here in our community, but around the world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you've done in our lives. God, we, we know that you can do more than we could ever ask or imagine. And so, God, we, we give this to you, and we give you thanks and praise, and, and God, we trust that you are going to do great things. We believe in that, and we hope in that. And God, may you be honored and glorified. We love you, and we praise your name. Amen.
Gone and screaming from the mountains Gone and tell it to the masses He is God God, we trust in your spirit today. We trust in your, your speaking and your leading. God, I pray that you would come and bring life to each one of us. Just shine your light in the darkness.
means I'm a prisoner no more My shame was a ransom he faithfully Displayed on a criminal's cross Darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost Then Jesus arose with our freedom made hell. That's when death was arrested and My name is Samantha McIntyre Olson. I am the student pastor at our Crossroads congregation. And I have been spending a lot of time lately thinking about Marvel movies. Yep, I know that's a little bit of a weird thing to spend your time thinking about. Uh, but are any of you guys Marvel fans? Maybe. Um, how about this? Are any of you maybe former Marvel fans, but maybe a little over it now? Yeah, I'll be honest, that's, that's me. Um, I feel like that's probably how a lot of people feel. Uh, it, it was really awesome when it was big and like leading up to the finale. And now it's kind of like, what are we still doing? Um, but for some reason, despite that being like the sentiment repeated by many people, the box office numbers of the new Marvel movies continue to be huge. They top everything else that comes out at the same time. And it just, it's driving, it was driving me crazy. I was thinking like, what is the deal? Why is this happening? I know, I'm a little weird. It's okay. But the other day I was reading an article about this topic and I got my answer. Spoilers. Movie spoilers is the big reason why the Marvel franchise continues to completely destroy at the box office. 
It's not necessarily that everybody's sitting on the edge of their seat, can't wait to know what happens next and see what new threat is going to threaten the life as we know it for the third time this year. No. But it's people care just enough. They're just curious enough about the individual character that they want to know what happens, but they don't want it spoiled for them on the internet. And that small prick of curiosity and that desire to avoid spoilers makes people like me continue to buy tickets for these movies the week they come out to have a more pure experience. Now, if we're honest, pretty much everybody hates spoilers, right? We don't want to know what's going to happen at the end. Honestly, I think the people who read the final chapter of a book before they read the whole thing, I mean, watch out, they'll probably start a cult someday because there's some unique form of crazy, all right? But why is that? Why do we hate spoilers? It's because the fun of the movie or the book or the show or whatever place that you get these stories is in the part where they build tension. It's that building of tension, that, that waiting to see what's gonna happen. Is Thanos going to collect all six infinity stones? Will Harry and Sally realize that the person they've been looking for all along is each other? Will Rocky be able to defeat Apollo Creed? In the back of our minds, you know, we usually have an idea of where this is going and how it's gonna play out. But sitting there and waiting and watching and taking it every step of the way, I mean, that's what makes it so fun. That's what keeps you coming back for more. And knowing the ending, would just it, it takes the tension out of it. It ruins the fun. Now, I'll be honest, my husband is kind of weird in this area. He actually doesn't enjoy the tension in a story. Regularly, we will watch a movie or a show that I've seen and he hasn't. And right when it gets good and the tension's really starting to build and I'm like looking at him and be like, oh, I bet he's gonna love this. He turns to me and he's like, can you just tell me how it ends? Can, can you just like, I, I don't wanna like, I don't wanna experience this. Like, can you just, just tell me how it ends so I don't have to be stressed about it. And it drives me crazy because it's like, well, you're ruining all the fun, right? He doesn't have like a ton of patience to see how it's gonna play out. But the fact is that when it comes to real life, many of us are kind of like my husband. Many of us would appreciate a spoiler when we're in the midst of building tension within our own lives. When the questions come in like, how am I gonna pay the bills this month? Or is that test gonna come back negative or positive? That building of the tension loses its fun. When we are in the thick of life, patience for the end is pretty limited. And today we are finishing up our series in the book of James called Life Hacks. And I, I've really enjoyed this series. I love the book of James. It's like Proverbs for the New Testament. And in this book, over the last few weeks, we've seen how James talks to and walks the early Christians through what it looks like to actually live out your faith giving us these life hacks of how being a believer looks like in action and not just in word. So if you have your Bibles, we're gonna be spending our time today in James chapter five. You can go ahead and turn there. Today, James is telling us about the life hack of being patient. Now patience, patience is hard for me. I'm a big on to the next person. If I had a dollar for every time growing up, my dad told me, patience, grasshopper. I could buy a time machine and not have to wait anymore, right? Patience isn't very fun. And like, I know I am not alone there. If I know where I want to go, I just want to go. If I know that an answer is coming, I just want to know the answer. I mean, patience and tolerance is uh, a part of our culture. And so I feel like we can all relate. Our culture doesn't encourage patience. We're very instant results focused. We want what we want when we want it. But patience is hard, especially when it comes to patience in real, serious, difficult times. Patience for hard reasons and difficult seasons. Those situations that like make you laugh at people who can't find their favorite snack food at the grocery store, 
and their impatience, like the situations that make you like go and like cry in your car or keep you up late at night or just that make you cry out, say like, Lord Jesus, come now. But the good news is there is an incredible life hack that I get to share with you today for those situations. And we're gonna be looking at it in James chapter five, verse seven. Now really fast, before we dive in, just a reminder, James is writing here to the early Christians in a time where they were not the majority and they were not popular. Suffering is something that James talks about on multiple occasions throughout his short book, which tells us that our brothers and sisters he was writing to were in a season of suffering and a season of trials. And to them, in the midst of their suffering and trials, this is what he writes. Therefore, brothers and sisters, be patient until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth and is patient with it until it receives the, earthly, the early and late rains. You also must be patient. Strengthen your hearts because the Lord's coming is near. Therefore, be patient. Now, when I was in high school, I was taught this phrase. Uh, when you get to the word therefore in scripture, you need to ask, what is the therefore there for? It's a good question. Well, James starts out this chunk of the, by his passage talking about cautioning rich people, warning them not to be consumed by their finances and not to oppress others with their wealth. Because if they do, they will face judgment from the Lord. Therefore, in light of this knowledge and warning, be patient when you find yourself in situations of oppression and difficulty. James is saying God sees what is happening. The Lord will come. The Lord will hear. So when you are on the short end of the stick, be patient. That's the kicker. That, that's the life hack here. And don't, don't brush past it. Because this life hack, this thing here, it, it's easy to have our eyes kind of glaze over when we read it. But it's like the life hack of life hacks. It's, it's far more life-changing than how you strain the water from your pasta or learning that you can use a fork to dip your Oreo in milk and keep your fingers dry. Now this life hack, it helps us endure the things of this life. Be patient because the Lord will come back. And when he comes, righteousness will reign. Your victory is coming. So if you're one of those people that wants that spoiler alert for your life, here it is. Now, I was a little infamous growing up in my family for spoiling movies. It was purely innocent. I just thought I was telling people the cool stuff they were about to see in a movie and didn't realize I was ruining the whole thing. But today I'm going to fulfill my childhood failings for you and I'm going to spoil the end. Jesus wins. Jesus has won. Jesus is winning and Jesus will win. And Jesus winning isn't just simply like a platitude to make you feel better. It's not some band-aid to cover a gaping, bleeding wound. It is the biggest, most powerful, most comforting thing you could possibly hear. Because Jesus wins. It means that when Jesus comes back, and scripture tells us he will come back, the sin and the pain of this world will wash away. Wrongs will be made right and all of the things we have put our hope in in Christ will be fulfilled. In Revelation 21, they tell us what it looks like when Jesus wins. It says he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Grief, crying, and pain will be no more because the previous things have passed away. So spoiler alert, victory is coming. And if you are a follower of Christ, that victory is for you. 
knowing how the story ends and knowing it ends with victory will help you to endure seasons of waiting and pain and tension in your life. Hear this, knowing the end doesn't eliminate the waiting, but it enlightens the waiting with what is to come. Knowing the ends doesn't eliminate the waiting, but it enlightens the waiting with what is to come. So what does this look like practically for us? What what does it look like to live out patience in light of knowing that Jesus will come back and when he does, he will win? Well, James is a good boy and he gives us three examples in this passage of what it looks like, painting that picture of what it looks like to practically live out patience. So let's go back and read that passage, James 5, verses seven and eight again. Therefore, brothers and sisters, be patient until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth and is patient with it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also must be patient. Strengthen your hearts because the Lord is coming near. Now, I'm from Oklahoma, so I really appreciate a good farming reference in scripture. But I really, really like this one. So what you need to understand is that in the climate they lived in, their farming season was bookended with the early early rain (laughs) and the late rain. So the early rain came at the end of the time when they would have planted. So they needed to have their seeds in the ground before the early rain came. And then right before the time of harvest would come the late rain. And the late rain was crucial. Without it, the harvest wouldn't happen. And so the farmer had to wait for the rain, but he had to wait expecting it would come. So he had to put his money in the ground first. Before the early rain came, he had to plant. He had to prepare his field, trusting and expecting that the rain would come. And so that is the first way that we practice patience. By number one, wait expectantly. Move forward trusting that it's going to work. Move forward trusting that God will guide you and be with you. Don't wait for the rain to plant your seeds. Instead, prepare the fields of your life expecting that the rain will come. Moving on to the second one, let's jump down to verses 10 through 11. It says this, brothers and sisters, take the prophets who spoke in the Lord's name as an example of suffering and patience. See, we count as blessed those who have endured You have heard of Job's endurance and you have seen the outcome that the Lord brought about. The Lord is compassionate and merciful. Now, if you wanna talk about suffering, (laughs) the prophets are a good place to start. Prophets of God in the Old Testament endured all kinds of hardships and suffering. In Luke chapter four, Jesus even says that no prophet was accepted in his hometown. And what I love here, though, is that James points us directly to the example of Job. Now, when it comes to stories of suffering from the Bible, I think Job easily makes the top five every time. If you're somebody who likes to click on those, like, you know, BuzzFeed lists of, like, top, you know, scenes in a TV show that make you cry, yeah, if they had one of those for, like, sob stories in the Bible, Job's on it every single time. Job was a man of great position and power, He was abounding and blessing of all kinds when we meet him. In fact, Job 1.1 introduces him. And I just wanna read it to you really fast because it's it's incredible the way they, they set up who this man is. It said, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned from evil. He had seven sons and three daughters. He had 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 50 yoke of ox, yoke of oxen, my bad, 500 female donkeys. This man was the greatest man in all the East. I mean, that's a glowing introduction if I've ever heard one. I mean, this guy had it all until piece by piece and bit by painful bit, it all got taken away from him. 
To start off, his livestock died. All of them. They were stolen, dead, killed, burned, whatever. All right? And this is how it went because it's, it's so bad. First, a servant came up and was like, sir, 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 your sheep are dead. And before he's done telling the story of how they died, another servant shows up and says, sir, 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 your camels have been stolen. And before he's done telling that story, another one shows up and says, your oxen have all been killed. And before he's done talking, another servant shows up and says, in a freak accident, all 10 of your children have died. In one day, probably in the span of about 10 minutes, it all went away. And this is how Job responded. Bible says that Job rose up, he tore his robes and he shaved his head. That was the way they, they showed deep mourning and distress. And then he fell on the ground and he worshiped. And he said, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked shall I return. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job was in pain, but he looked at the promise of God and that promise enlightened how he mourned and how he endured these struggles. Now the book of Job doesn't stop there. That's about chapter one. Job goes on for almost like 40 more chapters and in that time, Job gets sick and he just, he loses everything else. Like he has open bleeding sores. And throughout the course of this book, his friends come up to him like one by one. He has this handful of friends and they come up and they all say, why don't you just curse God already so you can die and be done? And Job says, no. The next one comes up, why don't you curse God already so you can just die and be done? And Job again refuses and on and on until even his wife, says, haven't you endured enough? Curse God so that he will strike you dead and you can be done. But Job waits quietly. He maintains his faith and he waits for the rest of the story to play out. He waits quietly for God to work. And so for us, that is the second way that we practice patience is by wait quietly. We wait quietly. This means we don't need to make a big deal when we're in the middle of waiting. We don't need to intentionally draw attention to ourselves. We don't go around complaining or posting about it all the time. Now, I'm, I'm not saying don't talk to your friends or seek counsel or prayer or comfort. I'm not saying that at all. Those are good things. You should do that. But what I'm saying is you don't need to make sure that everyone around you knows and is reminded constantly that you are in that season. You just need to wait and trust in quiet faithfulness. The third and final thing we see here is this. Number three, wait confidently. James 5 a it says, you also must be patient. Strengthen your heart because the Lord's coming is near. Throughout this passage and throughout his entire book, again, James points to confidence, being sure, having trust, having faith. We have a confidence. We, we have a hope in Jesus. And that is not a confidence or a faith that is small or fragile. The hope we have in Jesus, it, it's like how a little kid looks up at their dad and thinks he's like Superman. Like a little three-year-old boy looks up at his dad and is like, wow, there's nothing my dad can't do. And he's like, sure, his dad could lift a building on his shoulders. But the thing is, is that we don't have to grow up and realize that there is a fault because that's what happens in a child. They grow up, they realize their parent is faulted and they have all these other things and they're just like them. No, we get to continue to walk a life with God and realize time and again that he is who he said he is and he is strong and he is sure and he continues on his promises. There is no fault we're gonna discover one day. God is good and God is worthy of that trust and that awe. Micah 7, 7 says this, and I want you to hear it. And I want you to put it in your heart and I want it to sink deep into your bones. He says, I will wait confidently upon the Lord. 
I will wait confidently upon the Lord. Wait expectantly, wait quietly, and wait confidently. These examples show us that whether it's your day-to-day work or your deepest pits of despair, whether life is a little bumpy or it's so dark you just can't see the way forward, lean into God, lean into his promises. Strengthen your hearts because the coming of the Lord is near. Like we don't, we don't know when Jesus is coming back. Scripture says nobody knows the time or the place, right? But it says he is coming back. And we serve a God who always fulfills his promises. So he is coming back. And we know what we are promised when he does. And in that we can rejoice. And in that we can endure. And in that we can wait patiently. So maybe today you're sitting there and you're feeling like Job. You're feeling like the waves of life just keep crashing again and again and again and they don't give up. Maybe your family is struggling. Maybe finances are tight. Maybe you've lost your job or your job is just getting harder and harder and harder. Maybe the bills keep piling up. Maybe an unexpected diagnosis has made you feel like the ground is literally crumbling beneath your feet. Maybe you're in a season where you're just just waiting. Waiting for something new, waiting for something more, waiting for something to change. Maybe you're in a season where you are feeling very impatient for the next season. Maybe all you are is just you're waiting and looking to what's next and you just can't sit. Maybe you feel like you just need to sit there and cry and say, come Lord Jesus, come. But no matter the depth of your struggle in the season, whether it is small or whether it is deep, remember there is victory on the other side. Remember that Jesus is coming back. And when he does, all of these troubles will be washed away. Let knowing the end Enlighten your waiting and struggle. Let the knowledge of your promised victory strengthen your patience. And when you look at that mountain in front of you, even when you don't know how you're even gonna begin to climb it, remember that on the other side of it, you know how the story ends. Jesus has won. Christ will come back. And on that day, the sin and pain of this earth will wash away. And if you have put your faith in him as your Lord and Savior, he is going to wipe every tear from your eye and you will get to be with him forever. That is how your story will end. That is your promise. That is your victory. Let it enlighten your waiting.
Jesus, you change everything. Lives healed, hope found, here now. Jesus, you change everything. You change. Heavenly Father, this is how I refer to God when I pray. These names I use have real significance for me. I don't know my earthly father. This was rough when I was younger. But when I came to Christ, I discovered that I have always had a father waiting for me with open arms. His unconditional, redeeming love has been wonderful. My heart's response to the new life he has given me is loving obedience. The same loving obedience a child has for their father. Just think of the loving obedience Jesus exemplified when he died on the cross for our sins. Our Heavenly Father instructs us to keep his commandments. So I choose to fight with everything in me to do so in the midst of all the distractions and chaos and the outright evil I see in the world all around me. Sometimes it's a struggle, but I have to literally choose to look up to my Father, focusing on remembering how coming to Jesus has changed my life and seeking his will for my future. As we move into a time of communion, we can practice loving obedience together. Please gather whatever elements you have at home, whether it be juice or water. Pause the video if necessary. I'm going to pray, and then we will take communion together while reading through Mark 14, 22 through 26. All while, keep in mind how awesome the Father's love is. Heavenly Father, Thank you for the message and the messenger. Thank you for being our father. Thank you for being my father. Still our minds and our thoughts as we practice loving obedience to you right now. Before we take communion, search our hearts and reveal hidden things for which we ask you forgiveness. Help us to remember the precious blood shed for our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we will read through Mark 14, 22 through 26. As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. Then he broke it into pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take it, for this is my body. And then he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them and they all drank from it. And then he said to them, this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice for many. I tell you the truth, 
I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Then they sang a hymn and went into the Mount of Olives.